Good morning. It is Thursday, December 3rd, and we are here with Cliff Brake. Uh, and we are going to talk today about simple IoT. Uh, Cliff, do you want to take it away and introduce yourself? And uh, let's get started. Sure. Yeah, this is Cliff Brake. I, I'm a contractor consultant. I've been doing this for about 15 years. And lately, I've been doing uh, working mainly in the IoT space. Um, working with with companies producing products where they want to get information from their device that's deployed in the field um, up to the cloud or, or some way to be remotely accessible. So I I kind of started out in as, as a as a hardware engineer and then um, moved into embedded Linux and I did that for a number of years and I still do quite a bit of embedded Linux work helping people um, build devices that embed Linux. And what we found is, is when you're using Linux, typically you're handling data and that just naturally uh, moved me into the IoT space because people want to get their data more accessible. So that's kind of where I came from and, and how I got to where I'm at. So we're seeing a, an IoT explosion, if you will, and really it's, there's a lot of technologies that are coming together right now that's really making IoT interesting, and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of things we can do, and I'll just briefly go over these. And of course, we have the cloud, you know, very low cost um, servers. We can spin up a server for $5 a month and or, or use other services that, that make it very low cost. There's a lot of compute resources at the edge now that we didn't have before. And you have everything from, you know, your maker Raspberry Pi, high-end NVIDIA Jetson, which you can do AI on. We have this Ver VeriSite system on module. So it's a low-end device, you know, starts in the low $20. And, and this has been very popular in products I've worked on. And um, this red board is, is more of an industrial single board computer, has a slot for a, for a cellular modem, as well as a number of IO features on it. So it's also an interesting device. So being able to run Linux at the edge really opens up a lot of opportunities and, and I believe this is where IoT really gets interesting when you can do stuff, when you can run languages like Go or Rust or Pascal or whatever at the edge um, and, and, and really, really add a lot of functionality there. Connectivity is also something that's changing a lot recently with the advent of CADM modems and cat out <clears throat> cellular cellular connectivity you know we can now connect a device for a couple dollars a month and get a, a data allowance in in the tens of megabytes per month so this this really opens up a lot of opportunities that weren't available before because if it if it costs you 20 or 30 dollars a month to connect your device you know that really limits the applications, but if you can connect a device for a couple dollars a month, that's 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 a game changer. You know, it's completely changes the IoT um, landscape, in my opinion. And of course, you have other things, LoRaWAN and Bluetooth Mesh. Those are more local networks, but again, it's it's very very interesting technology and, and opens up a lot of opportunities. Come on, LoRaWAN, we can get like five or 10 kilometers out of that, can't we? Yeah, yeah, I guess it's actually a, it's actually a, a wide area technology. So yeah, that's exactly I'm, uh, right. Um, for the record, actually, I just wanted, because we're using a lot of uh, acronyms, uh, I will sometimes interject for various things, including even being like IOT, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. um, that we just yeah. sort of uh, shorten uh, and uses as extreme uh, shorthand. Um, mm -hmm. I'll try and share some links in the forum around LoRaWAN because I'm. Uh, it's a really, really interesting one. 
Um, and uh, I actually am reminded that uh, uh, it's something that we should stick in uh, Brooks House Vision's office uh, in Vancouver, just as a sort of like interesting little thing. Um, you know, uh, we're interested obviously in sort of like commons infrastructure and it's the kind of thing where if you already have an internet connection running a lower line gateway, I think, I think they're like a hundred or two hundred dollars to put one, uh, together. Right. 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 You can get cards for raspberry Pis or complete units. Right. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Sorry. I just like, and then, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll kind of poke at you to say, wait, what's that acronym? Sure. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate that. So I'm kind of moving fast because I don't want to I don't want to bore people. But you know, if, if there's anything you'd like to discuss more, please, please, please let me know. So yeah, th this connect connectivity um, really changes things, and it's it's really you know most devices where before you you know you would really question the need to add connectivity now it's just like well we can't afford not to and um, so along with these low cost connectivity plans we also have these technologies for connecting devices and there's a company out of China named Quectel which is producing very high quality modems and they're an um, amazing company and their, their modems start at, at like um, around $10. You can get a cellular modem to put in your device. And NimbleLink is a company that takes these Quectel modems and, and modems from other companies and packages in a pre-certified module. So these, like the Skywire NimbleLink modem is already pre-certified with all the cellular carriers and with the FCC and all, has all the regulations. So it costs a bit more in the, in the $50 range, but you can just plug that right into your device and it's already certified. It's an easy way to get in, get into the space. Um, Nordic right. Semiconductor, <laughs> go ahead. Right, so, so this is really something that probably people aren't aware of at all, um, which is we can use something like Wi-Fi and it's on a, an unregulated band, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? But for cellular, so that you don't mess up other people's stuff, you have to go through these certification processes, whether it's like the SIM card for the for the carrier or more broadly at a, on a, um, a country level basis. So that's something to, to kind of be aware of. There's hobby projects, and then there's you need to kind of deploy this and not get sued. Right. Uh, and that's where these these components come together. That's right. And and carriers like Verizon in the U.S., you know, they have the, the best and widest coverage. So many systems, we need Verizon uh, cellular plans. And Verizon is, is very particular. They will not let a device on their network unless the the IMEI number from that device is in their database. So it's not good enough just to have a model certified. Every device has to be in their database before they'll allow it on the network. So, you know, right. So this is one of the things of using centralized systems like this. You're really on a managed network. Yes. Right. And the IMEI is a little, it's not really like a MAC address, but it's a unique identifier in, in modern cellular networks um, that, that they then use to tie to the plan and the account and everything else like that. So they know all of the, the um, uh, and you have, if you haven't signed up for an account yet, even if the IMEI can connect to it, it literally will just say unknown IMEI and not let you connect. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a hassle, but, you know, companies are making solutions that makes it very, again, very easy to, to do this. And you know the cost will continue to go down over time because again the the, the modem hardware itself starts at ten dollars, so it's it's very affordable. This device at the top here is a Nordic semiconductor cellular modem module. They just came out with it, and it it um, has an application processor built into the <clears throat> into the module, so it's a very small, low cost solution as well. 
and then most people are, are familiar with ESPA 266. It's like a couple dollar Wi-Fi module that you can run, you know, Arduino software on it or, or, you know, custom software. So it's kind of a complete Wi-Fi connected computer for, for, you know, like a couple dollars. So, you know, these are just things just showing that connected devices are becoming lower and lower cost and, um, just a little insight into where that's going. So, uh, for reference, Wi-Fi cards circa 2000 maxed out at 10 megabits and cost about $250. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So things keep changing. So that's why we're here. Um, open source again. There's so many projects and, and so many, so much technology available just for the using. And I don't, I don't mean to leave out anything here, but these are just some things that came came to mind at the top of my head. But one one thing I really think is is changing things is is the new new generation of languages that we have available: Go and Rust and Elm and and, and I could go on and on. There's there's many good options, but these these languages. Um, allow us to do things much easier than in the past. You know, as, as, as an embedded Linux engineer, I, I spent a lot of time getting C and C++ programs to cross compile for embedded systems. And that's, that's basically what the Yocto project does. There's another project called BuildRoot. You know, it, it's, a, it's a science unto itself. You know, how, how do you build these large applications and cross compile them. It's very hard, very hard problem. And languages like Go, and, and I've heard Rust as well, but I've, I've not actually used it. But with Go, you know, the tooling is, is phenomenal. We can, I can build a Go application for any target. It could be Mac, Windows, ARM, ARM64, Linux, BSD, you know, I, I can build build a binary for any of those targets from my workstation without any extra work or, or tooling. So, and, and just the language features, you know, it's it's. Um, I believe it's really changing. You know, the the way we 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 can work with these systems. So, again, that that stuff you folks are all familiar with. But again, I think it's. I, I think it's really interesting and worth highlighting. Um, so, you know, really interesting description of where the um, universal binary is super important. And you've got embedded support, obviously, ARM64 with Apple's new chips being super interesting. Um, I shared a link in the, uh, in the chat that it looked like um, someone who's going to do the work of porting first class Linux support um to the desktop and laptop chip that that apple has um and he he's at i think six thousand dollars a month on patreon so it's clearly something that people are oh, wow. <laughs> are interested in in supporting which i think is super interesting and and he was saying in his write-up of course that um because apple's chip is custom um, that they, you know, they have to write custom support for it. But at the same time, we've got this long tail of ARM-based small devices. Um, so I think the ARM ecosystem um, is going to get a lot more attention in the next little while. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So were, were you, did you move to Go from something else? Can you maybe talk a little bit about like, I'm guessing you've been programming for some time. Yes. <laughs> For anyone who's not looking at the video, just to listen to the audio, this is um, me teasing uh, Cliff about how he and I have been around for a while. Yeah, we, we have a little more perspective than maybe some, but yeah, so I, you know, C++ was the standard language to use for embedded systems, embedded Linux systems for, for most of the projects I've worked on. And, um, and, and for some things, it's still the best solution, you know, if you need uh, cute graphics or open CV or, you know, some machine learning, it, it may still be the best solution. 
but my my experience with C++, you know, is I have worked on some very large projects with, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code. And a, a typical experience is several times over the course of this project, you, ha you have your application crashing out in the field. And you don't know why, and you don't have a stack trace. And, you know, you're trying to reproduce this problem. And, and again, this didn't happen very often, but when it happened, it was painful. It was, it was really bad. And, and again, the, the, the cross compilation story for, um, for C++ programs and handling dependencies was, was a very difficult problem. So along comes Go and, you know, I've done three or four reasonable size systems in Go and I, I've not had any 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 problems yet with like weird crashes out in the field and if it does crash I get us we get a stack trace in the log you know it's 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 built into the language and the same with elm for the front end you know we've you know its story is no crashes that's that's basically its story and so I you know coming from that background it, it's it's really something I appreciate so I don't know if yeah I mean I'm, again this this is the kind of stuff that I want to highlight like that that this is a thing that's happening whether or not kind of the um, mass market more realizes it so I think go is an interesting story um, you know um, I'm going to be explicit I'm guessing you don't need ded dedicated build or release engineers when you're working with go no, no, it's built, the tool right. is built right in. So it's just go build and you're done. You know? My experience with C++ is there's uh, the person who has figured out troubleshooting builds mm -hmm. and releases. And, you know, maybe you can get your local stuff kind of working, but you're like, hopefully that person is around and can get it working. Whereas with Go, you're continuously building locally and it works. Um, an Elm, uh, just to um, uh, add to that, um, we literally have like several examples of people we're talking to who are running um, uh, applications in, let's say, Angular or something like that, and who are switching their front ends to Elm. Uh, these are just kind of regular SaaS apps uh, that have some sort of back end framework and then have, have used something else like Angular or React on the front end. And they're struggling with shipping stuff that ends up like breaking in production. Um, so the story that we actively have heard is um, uh, a slow but noticeable set of people switching to Elm to solve some problems they have about like ensuring that they have code that that runs more correctly where they get caught at compile time uh, before it ships to production. Um, right. uh, so definitely something we're seeing as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like the Elm plus Go is sort of actually, or Go embedded, um, are you using Go on sort of for for the back end of any web app stuff that you build as well? Like yeah, yeah. So actually we use one code base for most projects and part of it builds the back end and part of it builds the device software. So it's it works out real well that way. Modular and yeah. anything that you define ends up getting shared across the, the back end that exactly. way. Exactly, data structures and yeah, it's it's really nice. Is there a framework or anything you're using in Go for the kind of like web app layer or are you just more using like REST API endpoints or? Yeah, at this point I'm just using uh, REST APIs and then the front end just pulls its data. So they're, they're really decoupled. Decoupled. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I just like, this is exactly a thing that I think is, is happening and that we should talk more about. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, oh. with an IOT, sorry, Benjamin, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, I, so I was, it's really interesting. Um, what, what surprised me a little bit is actually go for like edge devices, because in my mind, like embedded devices, you like go is a garbage collected language, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't expecting that Go as actually a, a, a preferred choice for, for like embedded devices, but maybe is there sort of a barrier where you say like, okay, most edge devices actually do have plenty of memory and capacity and, and the garbage collecting isn't a thing. Um, 
Well, as soon as, you, as soon as you as soon as you have Linux on an edge device on a, on an edge device, you know pretty much any Linux capable um, processor these days can run Go very well. So hmm. memory is is so cheap that you know 128 megabytes of RAM is pretty much the minimum you'll see on an embedded hmm. Linux system. Time has moved on. And, you know. No, no, Go, is re Go is really pretty efficient, you know, even though it has garbage collection and all that, you know, uh, the binaries usually run from 10 to 20 megabytes and it, and it uses 10 to 20 megabytes of memory. Mm. Typically, you know, for just a, a small application. So compared to Java and Python and Node.js and, and all these other runtimes, Go is 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 way more efficient from my experience. So. Yeah, I mean, we like the only I mean, the Go experience, I, I call it an Ethereum node and, and we did like occasionally have spikes on it. But I guess it's a very different scale of like garbage collecting and memory to, to run an EVM than to do. And uh, so, so maybe those spikes are, are more more contained in in normal uh, better environment yeah that, that's a good point you know if, if you're running uh, go in the cloud and and really pushing it you, you probably will see more problems but you know for an edge device it's just collecting some data and, and establishing communication you know it's it's been a Pretty good solution good. Fair enough. and I, I think rust will come on strong for those applications where you really need the performance or you want to push it down into a non-linux system like a a MCU or a microcontroller. Hmm. I think Rust will eventually move into that space and fill that need very well. Yeah, we're that's sort of we we don't uh, we're not doing any Rust yet at at Fission, but it's sort of the thing that we have tagged as the um, path to uh, writing code that makes its way into WebAssembly modules. Mm -hmm. So um, certain you know um, functions. Uh, that have to be performant to be running in, in client devices or um, in some ways kind of encapsulated in an interesting way, right? So you have have to have well-defined interfaces in and out of a, a WebAssembly module. Um, that is a bit of a different story than, uh, you know, concatenating uh, 25 different JS modules together. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm, I'm curious. So I've, I've never done... Uh, anything serious, you know, with a, uh, you know, edge or embedded device, but I have played a little bit with nerves, um, which obviously, you know, similar, they, they stuck a, a Linux on, um, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi or, or, or similar, and then load up the, um, the Erlang VM, the, the beam, um, which a lot of people are, seem to be using. Um, if you used it, any opinions, thoughts versus um, going directly to something like Go? Yeah, I, I've not looked at Erlang. I've, I've not used it, so I unfortunately don't have a, really any experience here. Okay. Cool. You're, you're, you're always like basically whenever you put up like half a different dozen uh, uh, programming languages on a slide, you're going to get this programming language theory <laughs> crowd here going like, okay, let's talk programming languages. So we, we should yeah. let you move on too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. One, one thing that I really like about Go is the runtime is embedded. So that's in the binary and it's small and efficient. So um, over Java or again, I've not t tried Erlang, but, I, but I, I, if I understand right, the runtime is, is external. So it, it is, they've created this distribution called, called NERVS where they've um, uh, basically built a Linux, like a very thin Linux plus the runtime so that it is just a single binary that will deploy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a separate, like, or I guess the uh, Erlang Ecosystem Foundation is actually um, providing them support now, but it's, uh, it's just an open source project. Excellent, yeah, that sounds super yeah. interesting. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, we'll we'll add links to the show notes to to this. Um, it's yeah. exactly the kind of thing that we can dig into later. Right. Okay. So the, the the areas the applications I've worked on, you know, the really interesting ones are the ones that 
or the cost savings quickly pays for the solution. So and I believe there's there's more problems to be solved right now in, in, in the IoT space than there are people to solve them. So I, I feel this is a really um, huge market, a good, good, good place to work right now. And, you know, anytime you can save somebody a trip at, to inspect something like a pump in a lift station or, you know, an irrigation pump or, you know, you know, people are used to driving out once a day and checking these systems to make sure that, you know, people's pumps are still working. And, and, and uh, anytime we can save trips, you know, it really improves the quality of life and, and saves a lot of costs as well as reducing damage and waste, you know, if, if, um, if you have an irrigation um, fertilizer injector, you know, you want to make sure that that's putting the optimal amount in and you're not, or not overdoing it for the sake of the environment and, and, and again, costs. So th these are the types of systems I've worked on and, and um, it, it's really exciting to see systems that really realize real savings. So. As I've worked with IoT systems, I've, I've come to the realization that these are distributed systems and it's, it's very helpful to think of them as such. And I will show a, just a section of a, of a video here to illustrate this. And, and this device on the right is, is, a, is one of the projects I've worked on where there's a an LCD and a control panel at the device out in the field that you can interact with and program it and configure it out in the field. Or you can access the device remotely through a, a portal, a cloud portal. And in this case, the customer wanted to change configuration settings from either device. So once that happens, you have a, you have a classical distributed system where, where you need to modify data in multiple places. So, you know, in this case, they wanted to be able to the, change their tank levels remotely. So, um, you know, if we press the fill button in the cloud portal, you'll notice that instantly the, the tank level changes on the device itself. So this is, this is the type of thing people are looking for. They're looking for real-time response. They're looking to be able to change settings at either place. And once we enter into this type of system, it's, it's much more than just, you know, some little device sending sensor values to the cloud and showing them on a graph. So th this kind of provides the background for, for where the simple IoT project is going and the, and the types of problems it's trying to solve. So I don't know if that makes sense, but um, so as as I've worked with several projects and several iterations, you know, kind of where we where we might start is is we have a data structure that captures the system state, and maybe another data structure that captures the um, the I.O. from a particular device, you know, this device might have a number of analog inputs and a handful of digital inputs, and we have a data structure that represents all that. So kind of the first pass might be to, you know, just send these data structures over the wire to the cloud. And, um, you know, that, that kind of works okay, but <laughs> at some point you're, you're sending data more often than you want. And anytime you add a new device, all the all the pieces that t that handle this data have to change as well. So eventually, we kind of settled on a on a sample data structure that we use to send. It's more of a generic data structure that that has a timestamp. Um, if the data was averaged over a certain amount of time, we might have a, a duration so we know what amount of time that data was averaged over. And once we settled on a on the sample data structure, a lot of things became easier because uh, the infrastructure 
to handle this type of data could be common across the entire system. You know, if we have averaging routines, um, the, the storage, the time series database, everything could just use the same data. So that, that really helped a lot. Um, again, I come from a hardware um, OS background, so, so some of this stuff may be pretty obvious, but it, it took me an iteration or two to get it. The same with device config, you know, it kind of started out as is a as a broad, deeply or somewhat nested data structure with all the different values and and um, fields of, of data that we needed to represent. And again, this works pretty well until you need to start editing this config on both the device and in the cloud. And then, how do you synchronize this broad? data structure with lots of fields in it. So based on what we learned from sending samples, um, we concluded, or I concluded that it, we could just simply represent every configuration value as a point and every, every data sample as a point. So now the sample data structure, we, we now call this a point because it's not always just a sample. And these points represent the system state and config for what we're now calling a node. And in order to, um, you know, as, as, we, as we've kind of built out on this, the entire system has become a tree of nodes and if you need to add more structure to the system, you just add a, a more hierarchical nodes to the system. So this has really, it seems to be working out pretty well. Um, again, what, one of the benefits is, you know, once once you have the infrastructure to handle all this, it's very easy to add add new functionality. And I, I could do just a quick demo of what this looks like in the current UI. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So I'll just switch to my terminal. Just start over with a clean database. So. Okay, let's switch. Switch back to the browser. Give this root name a node, or a root <coughs> node name, node a name. So basically, um, again, this is just a tree of nodes, and we can drill down into child nodes. We can also expand a node detail, look at each node, what's, what's actually in it. And then as we send new, new data to the system, um, this also creates new nodes. So I would just send a few sample values. And now we'll see two, two new device nodes that, that just showed up. So one one thing that's uh, uh, one thing that a lot of my customers need is they're, they're producing devices that they sell, and they need they need to give their users access to these devices. So now we have the concept of we need users and groups. So let's say we want to give um, a new user access to device number one. So the way we would do that is add a group. might add a new user for this group. And 
And then if we want to give Joe access to device number two, we can move that move that device in, into the group A. So let's do that. So now we have group A. It has a user Joe in this device two device. So if we log out, log in as Joe. Now we'll see group A and just just the device that, that Joe has access to. So this is using a tree. It, it, it's working out pretty nice. We can we can create as many groups, nest them any way we want. And basically it, it's an easy way to do permissions and groups. So th again, this is all pretty early. I've, this code has just recently been written. So it's, um, but as we start to build out the config on this device, we might add a, a Modbus port, which is an ins a standard industrial protocol. And um, let's call this Modbus port. Again, we can give it a little bit of configuration. Ninety six hundred baud takes me back, yep. <laughs> and it's amazing how how common this this protocol still is, even though it's twenty plus years old. You know, it's very common in the industrial space. So to sorry, Cliff. Mod I think it's more like thirty at this point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So um, now that we just defined a Modbus port, we can add IOs. You know, we could add like a temperature sensor, give it a Modbus ID and address. So basically you come up with these different standard uh, types. Yes. Um, types, and right. then that lets you kind of generate these different node types and, and it kind of have this generative UI that, that, that inherits all of these things. Um, right. Mm -hmm. I guess a lot of these things aren't really you know, as an example, there's no USB hid. So uh, with this older stuff, so it, a lot of this is just getting the config right mm -hmm. that you have to shuffle around. Yeah, exactly. Like Modbus is you pretty much have to define everything. It's not plug and play, you know, like modern. Um, but, you know, eventually you might have GPIOs on your single board computer or A to D channels you want to configure. So eventually this will be built out to support all of the IO on your device. And, so. and the, the background on this, like, so you've, uh, you basically have, um, you do consulting um, and you often work with, uh, with companies that are doing some software play and then realize they have to do hardware and they bring you in to do the, the hardware. So at the end of the day, they just again have sort of a REST API or an aggregation. That's the, that's the context here usually. Yeah, and, and actually on the last couple projects, I've, I've done a lot of the software too, so. Okay. You know, one of my, one of my customers is actually running the simple IoT in, in the cloud for their portal. So, and um, so. so you found yourself basically continuing to. Uh, I don't know if you have this later, so I'm going to ask some of this stuff a little bit now. Um, do Do you have some like why simple IoT? Yeah. Um, I guess what, what I feel, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to go in, start yet another IoT project because there's so many of them out there. <laughs> um, and there's, there's a lot of good solutions, a lot of services, but I, I feel that there's, there's several things I feel are important. One is, is a truly distributed nature where, you know, like we can sync the config intelligently between you know between different parts of the system so like in in this example here um, <clears throat> you, 
you know, this, this device number two, once you start adding config, you know, all of the nodes from device two down will be synchronized to remote, you know, you could edit the config in the, in the cloud and then all of these nodes would be synchronized down to the device. And um, I, I feel that's a part that's, that's missing in a lot of solutions. And the, the other the other thing I I feel is important is 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 to own your platform, if you will, because you know if, if you own your platform, you have so much more flexibility what you can actually do with it. And um, a lot of these a lot of solutions, you know, it's it's quick to get something running, it's drag and drop, but once you once you really want to customize it and make it look like a real product to your customers, you know, then it's then you're somewhat limited in what you can do. So yeah. So um and I guess when you say like there's so many IoT projects out there, I guess in some ways you're also kind of talking about things that end up being um hardware manufacturers or others who end up having sort of some sort of software or subscription basis, which doesn't necessarily jive with, but I want to do custom uh, bounds of it. For you, was it really the combination of Go and Elm that was unique as well? Yeah, I would say partly. Um, yeah, th those are the, the lang languages I wanted to use. So, <laughs> you, you know, and, and and I guess the other problem that, you, you know, it's a, a lot of solutions are, are kind of designed for one-off one -off problems where, where you might set something up for one device, but to scale it to a hundred or a thousand devices, you know, if you have to manually set up every every new device, you know, and, um, and create a, a, a dashboard for it, if you will, you, you know, it, it just doesn't really scale. So that, that's another problem I feel. So, so this is really, this is, this is, this has come out of, these are the actual challenges when you run actual devices in the tens, hundreds or thousands in actual production. Right. <laughs> um, that these are the things that you end up needing. It's not a toy hackathon IoT project. It's like, this is hooked up to a 500 gallon tank right. that we need to know if it screws up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and when you say the config, that's also like, so you've, you've got sort of this um, physical on device connected thing where people might run toggles or put things in and then those config changes are are communicated so that they're reflected live in the system? Yes, exactly. So, you know, if, if they change the tank level to 500 gallons on the device, it shows up immediately in the portal. And if they change it to in the portal, it shows up immediately on the device. So that that's the type of config synchronization that really adds value. And, and again, we want it to be real time as well. I mean, that's what users expect when they change it one place, they want to see it change the other place immediately. So uh, distributed in real time, I think those are the, the real problems that real that IoT needs to solve. It's sitting in the real world where we yeah. expect real time, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So I, I guess um, I, I don't really don't have a have a lot yet. Um, what one thing I found is is I've kind of simplified data structures and and um, to add new functionality. It's been just really nice because you know basically you do a little UI work and you do a little work on the device to actually handle that that new node type or or whatever. And everything in between stays the same. So it's it's really been nice that way. You know, it's it, it may seem a little clunky to, to only have a limited way to store your data, but uh, there, it seems like there's also some advantages, so. Uh, James and I um, were heavily involved with the Drupal project. Um, oh, okay. 
And uh, one of the things uh, that happened very early was creating the content construction kit. Um, mm -hmm. It has all sorts of other things, but it basically meant that um, through a GUI interface, um, users could uh, create custom content types um, and structures. Uh, and Drupal would take care of doing um, horrible, terrible, bad things to shove it in a database on the back yeah. end. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's actually so, but I think that's, that is the very interesting thing at the end of the day is making it easier to do custom things really makes it so that it, you know, um, it, it, you, you said feels like a product, right? Um, um, and, uh, you know, there's challenges with that maximum flexibility. Um, uh, but at the same time, it means that you can very quickly put something together and you can always customize node types or extend it or other, other things like that over time, but it's probably the right way to get started with something that, um, you know, known good, um, and then just see what the issues are. I, I would say that probably data at one layer, are you, uh, is there a database in this system as well? What do you typically use for that? Yeah, so right now I'm just using um, a, a Go database, embedded database called Genji. And it's it's kind of like an, a, a SQLite-like thing, but it's it's more of a document store and it has a SQL type query syntax. So um, it, it's, it's kind of the Go answer to SQLite, you know, and it... Well, I think document store is the big difference there at the end of the day. And that's very much where we're leaning towards with, uh, with fission okay. is, um, if your expectation is that someone has a, as a start has to create and format a normalized SQL schema, um, that's a very big ask where if you can just start throwing data into a system, um, you know, or a basic models system which is not dissimilar to this, uh, that's probably the right starting point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I should be explicit for productivity and getting something working end to end as you discover what your system actually needs. Right. Um, so yeah, are you, I, what, what kind of um, like amounts of data? So, so that's on the go and embedded side. Um, are you then aggregating that somewhere else? Yeah. So basically, You, you know, the same database that runs on a Raspberry Pi, you know, the same exact system is running in the cloud and, and storing, storing this data in a database is a tree with nodes and edges. So, so basically the same things running on the cloud is on, is on the device. And um, I, I feel that for, for most, most IoT systems, like the ones I work in, we're talking hundreds, hundreds or, you know, thousands of devices. So, you know, this is not Google scale. This is, um, you know, and just the ease of sending, spinning up one process in the cloud and it has your database and everything embedded, you know, it, it's, it's just very simple to, to administer. So that's yeah. one of the, the goals as well. I don't want to have to spin up 10 services just to, just to run an IOT system. What? No. you? You don't want to become a Kubernetes uh, maintainer? Uh, you know, you, you got me there. I, that, that's the real, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, no, 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 this, this is great. I mean, this is, I would say this is a theme is that um, people look at solutions that get, you know, promoted at a conference or a talk from a Google or a Twitter or whatever. And um, those solutions are designed for gigantic scale yes. mm -hmm. um, and the overhead of scaling them down makes zero sense. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another pattern that we're essentially following um, um, and seeing like, okay, well, let's, let's have a serious discussion about, um, you know, Kubernetes should not be step one. Um, and that's the space that we're aiming at, right? And this is this is really some of the the, the shared, uh, you know, values I think that I that I'm seeing here as well. Yeah, and I, I believe, you know, as I've tried to solve these these somewhat difficult problems of synchronization of config in real time, 
what I found is, is the answer is really to make things simpler. You know, that's really the only way you're going to get anywhere. And um, it, it seems to be the, a different approach than what most people are just adding another layer and another layer. And, and I, I just don't feel like that's, that's what I'm interested in. So. Okay, I'm, I'm getting the name now. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, S simple deployment, simple uh, data structures. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a theme. Awesome. Um, what else do you want to cover? We're kind of uh, coming up to an hour here. Yeah. Uh, so I that that's about all I have. Perfect. Um, so if um, there's anything that anyone else wants to discuss, feel. Yeah. Any questions from the group? Um, is it, have you, I mean, have you thought about like using UCANS or have there been some discussions? I mean, it's the obvious question to ask since that it's a fission talk. Yeah. Um, so I, I, unfortunately I haven't had a lot of time to, you know, I, I set up a fission account and I, I, I just haven't had time yet to really play with it and really learn. So I, I definitely want to go back and, and walk, watch your talk from last week we were on holiday that day so i couldn't make it well well that, but, that's to talk to blockchains but maybe some of brooks talks on on UCANS might be directly applicable here okay. yeah we we, yeah, we had a brief um we had a james and i had a call with um with cliff uh where uh, i actually really liked his his statement was which was really like um what if the iot devices didn't have to talk to the cloud um, um, and like peer to peer syncing and, and, uh, and so on. Um, so really for a lot of this cliff's likely going to have to get his hands dirty all the way down to, um, you know, what does it look like to possibly use the IPFS protocol and run it? Um, and then secondarily, we talked about, well, if you want it encrypted, you're pretty much likely going to have to adopt, um, uh, WinFS. Um, and uh, which would give you that encryption. So what, what we came up with really in part was that um, the shape of this entire system at hundreds or thousands may in fact make sense where uh, Cliff would run an entire fission instance where the nodes each have accounts uh, basically. Um, so that, that might be a layer and obviously the, the individual pieces of UCANs and WinFS and encryption are, 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 are all there. Uh, it looks like Cliff that we've got, um, someone else we're talking to who wants to, uh, explore white labeling fission. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so it looks like we have to go in and actually scope the work, but because a lot of our stuff lives in DNS, um, the, it, it could, it could be as simple as, uh, someone, uh, essentially we choose to map, um, custom domains and it would just run on the same system and people could have their own usernames and, and, and other things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, wedging simple IT directly into fission might be a bit, bit much depending on the application, right? Uh, yeah. So some of the, the patterns might just be more applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm super interested in, in learning and and um, I'm just kind of drinking from a fire hose right now. So it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's out there. And it's it's super great to know that. Well, you know, I think um, and uh, uh, Ben, this is the exact kind of thing. Whether it's a research project or a grant or anything else like that as we're out and about and uh, we, we, we see anything related to IoT, we've got someone in our extended community of Cliff of saying, hey, is this possible? Would this be interesting? I think that's always the most interesting thing. If we can you know, find a joint funded project to work on, it would be amazing. Um, I definitely have a bunch of interest in, in uh, LoRaWAN and I know some people who have things out in the wild. So that might even be something that we do where, you know, Ben sticks a LoRaWAN gateway in, in his Berlin apartment and we stick one in Vancouver and, um, you know, uh, we have a, an excuse to have a, a simple IoT instance up to, to tinker with. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, we'll have to make something funny like, you know, like Canadian poutine delivery on demand or something like that. <laughs> um, this has been great. Um, I wanted to, so basically this is something that you, uh, so thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, really great to go, go into this space that, that uh, I certainly don't spend a, um, a lot of time with and, and that you're, you know, um, I really, really like a lot of those principles that you talked about. Um, and uh, so you do this as, you know, essentially a full-time consultant. Uh, BEC Systems is the name of your consulting company. That's right. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, this is what you do. If someone needs an IoT solution solved for real in production, uh, contact you through the, through the website. Right. Yeah, that's a good way. Um, and simple IT, it's an, it, it is an open source project on GitHub. Yes. Right. It's, it's, um, it's all out there. So it'd be yeah. great to, what is it? What is the license on it? Uh, Apache two Apache two license. Great. Um, and the rest of the stack, um, I think you do some work with embedded Linux systems as well. Yeah, we, we have a project called the Yo distribution. It's built on top of Yocto right now. So okay. it's basically a template. It's a sane way to use Yocto to build products. So it's very product focused. Right. So you keep putting together these different pieces that you keep needing. And since they get used for kind of custom projects, you put them out as open source. Do, do you talk with clients about the open source nature of that uh, or, or work that into your, your contracts in some way? Yeah, they, most of them, um, you know, some of them don't even care that we're using the Yo distribution because we're doing all the software work for them and they don't even see that. And then other customers, they, they over time, they, they pick up some of the work themselves and then, then they're, then they be kind of, kind of become aware of how it's put together. And then uh, some of us, some come because they, they like the project, but. Yeah, I, I find like this is a still um, an emerging area of how much as consultants we talk to customers about, by the way, the reason that I can do this for you at this price in this timeline mm -hmm. is because I'm using these building blocks. Right. Um, I think especially in front end, if you think, you know, React or Vue or whatever, I mean, Elm has a whole cloud of, of sort of modules and things like that as well, but that, mm -hmm. Um, it's not front and center that, oh, by the way, the reason that we're able to do this is because we don't have to write everything from scratch. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you, uh, in general, you're supporting this through uh, consulting. So you're, you're doing paid work and you get to build on Simple IT on that. Is there other ways that people can support Simple IoT? Do you have an open collective or a Patreon or anything like that right yeah, now? Yeah, not yet. So I'm definitely interested in, in suggestions where to go with that because um, I, I don't have much of a user base yet. So I, I think it's, I've been focused mainly on just getting the, getting kind of to an MVP status where, where the system by itself does something useful. Right. But uh, yeah, I definitely would like to explore all that as time goes on. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we're going to be working on over the next little while is uh, to normalize um, having projects have donation channels and other things like that set up um, uh, so that if someone wants to contribute that they can or, or sort of more like a vote that says, I want to see this exist in the world uh, kind of thing. Is that something uh, you'll be building into your platform? Um, partially, but, um, also there's lots of really great systems. So open collective is the one that we recommend, you know, you have a consulting uh, company and an entity and so on. Um, but for a lot of individuals who don't have a company, um, open collective takes care of being, um, a fiscal sponsor. So they have one in Europe, they have one, uh, in the U S so it's, it's kind of a meta platform. Um, we might consider becoming a fiscal host at some point that, that, that Fission could do. Uh, we definitely want to be involved in, in as kind of helping, um, helping developers get paid um, right. and, and re-normalizing that users pay for apps, essentially, whether that's a uh, donation. Um, if someone says, no, no, I don't want to run a business, it's, it's open source, but this 
buys my time so that I can spend time supporting and maintaining it. Or if they are indeed running a business and say, you know, I'm a software small business person. Um, um, so those are some of the things that we want to work on. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah, and that's a good segue. I do want to just cover before we drop, um, you also run kind of a community for software developers. Do you want to, can you, do you want to maybe even just pull up the discourse and yeah. tell us about it? So yeah, my, my associate who works with me on the, um, sure why it's not loading this of course is a typical demo experience <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the demo went flawless yeah <laughs> um so anyway we set up a discourse server over at tempdir.org and um yeah our, our thought is is to just have a place for people interested in technology to share share new things that are happening and, and and maybe for those of us who work in small organizations or remotely, kind of a the virtual water cooler, you know, where we can collaborate with others and, and, and kind of feel like we're connected to other professionals. So eventually my vision is to have kind of a a wide range of of interests where each person kind of shares what's happening in their field and their expertise so that, you know, we kind of get exposure to, to a broad range versus like a, like a forum where it's just about uh, Nats IO or it's just about this, you know, a lot of these discourse sites are very narrow, but I would kind of like this to be a broad. And I'm sorry, it doesn't load right now, so I will go debug that. Yeah, what, why don't you bring up the tempter.org site? So it is, it is, it's, a, it's a, so just so you know, uh, I, we run the um, discourse forum as well, and it was 504 in yesterday, so uh, I think there's an upgrade in there needed. Yeah. Okay, so you run it actively, you run a podcast around these topics too. Yes, right. We're trying to find people to talk to, so suggestions are welcome. And, and Kim Raj, the, 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 individual I do all this with he's we have a number of things we'd like to discuss as well too so it's been a lot of fun uh and and the focus today is kind of like independent software consultants and makers uh, uh skewing towards those working on embedded systems and 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 IOT um right. exactly great awesome uh well I think what I will do is I will hit stop on the record button so thank you very much uh, and